<clears throat> Just in case someone can't make it. All right, now I will bring you back. All right. Okay. Okay. Everything look good? Yep. All right. Uh, let, let's go ahead and get started here. So again, if you're here, you've probably been frustrated with conflicting information on houseplant care. You know, we all go online, we all type in our answers into Google and we get all sorts of different answers. So it can, it can be very easy to be frustrated with conflicting information. You might also be confused as to why you have various problems and we all get them, yellow leaves, brown crispy edges on our leaves, our plants aren't growing, we have pests, we have all sorts of stuff. So it can be confusing really to pinpoint the cause. And finally, you know, just maybe you just want to know how you can really get your house plants to explode and thrive. Um, you know, just like all the pictures that you see on Instagram and on, on any social media platform, right? We all, we all tend to post our, our, best, our best photos out there. And it can sometimes be misleading because not every plant will look like that in real life. So I'm here to help you. So like I mentioned, when we have a plant problem, where do we tend to go? We tend to go to Google, right? It all starts with the Google search and Google, we go to Google to solve all of our life's problems, right? Or does it? <laughs> does, it does it actually cause more confusion? So let me, let me give you a quick example of what I mean. So let's do a quick Google search. So let's say, so I have my Echeveria succulent here. And, you know, we might be wondering why is my Echeveria or whatever plant you have, why is my plant getting yellow leaves? So we automatically go to Google, type that in, and just say to yourself, um, you don't have to unmute, but what does Google tell you most of the time? Now, I'm overly simplifying this. There's a lot of sources on Google. It, it's, not, it's not just one entity. There's a lot of sources on Google. But what do you most often find? when you type in an issue, what, why is my plant getting a yellow leaf? Most of the time, oops, sorry. Overwatering. It tells you you've overwatered your plant, right? And I have cringe there in parentheses because that's, that's a very complicated term. Um, in fact, I, I feel so strongly about this word and I'll go into into some details very shortly here. I feel so strongly about this word and the, the behavior that it drives that I've included a section on overwatering in my book, Houseplant Warrior. Um, I will go into this a little bit um, more in depth shortly. Um, so the problem with using Google to diagnose, what, what, what's, the, what's the main issue in using Google? A lot of sources just over, overly simplify everything or they, they might regurgitate false information and then just keep propagating that material over and over again um, until you know, it, it, it leads to all these misconceptions. Or it just doesn't provide a full picture of your actual problem. Not every, not every problem has, a, has one simple answer to it. And in fact, many plant problems or woes can be caused, can and are caused by multiple factors. And oftentimes they're caused by completely opposite things. So what do I mean by that? Let, let's take a look at some examples now so that you can visually, visually see this. Drooping peace lilies. So I don't know about you, but I, th this is actually a funny, um, a funny instance. So I have, not, not this part, this is my peace lily, but I have another one that has larger leaves and I obtained that plant through actually from my dad's funeral from several, several months ago. So the, the funny part about this is I get so many emails from people asking how they can rescue their plant because, you know, there's special meaning behind it because they got it at someone's funeral. I, I just think it's, I, does anybody even buy these plants or does, that, does everybody get them from funerals? Um, but I, you know, I do have a plant for my dad's funeral and I, I obviously want to keep it alive and healthy. And a lot of people come to me with this issue. Why is my piece lily drooping? And what causes this? Is it caused by the potting mix being too dry? Or is it caused by, you know, quote, overwatering and maybe root rot? 
How do you know the cause? So in reality, both of these can cause, can cause your peace lily to droop. Some other issues, we have yellow leaves and I'll, I'll go into more depth. Um, you might, you probably already have questions in your mind right now, um, but I'll go into more depth shortly. Yellow leaves is another very common issue. So what's causing yellow leaves? Um, these leaves here are from my Pilea peppermoides or Chinese money plant. Many of you I'm sure have this plant at home as well. Is the potting mix too dry? Is it root rot? Is it too little light? What's causing it? All of these can cause yellow leaves. And finally, another super common issue are brown crispy leaf edges. This is my Aspidistra or Chinese evergreen. Um, you can see there's a lot of brown, brown tips on, on that plant. I know it caused it, but what can cause brown crispy leaf edges? Is your potting mix too dry? Is it root bound? Is it maybe improper watering? Is it the water quality? Is it maybe low humidity or fertilizer burn? All of these can cause brown leaf tips. So how do you know the cause? How do you know the cause? What is missing here? What is missing here? Observation. So I cannot tell you how many times I get questions from people saying, my plant's dying. I don't know what to do. Can you help me? And more often than not, let's go back to the Google, um, the Google instance that I just mentioned and the drooping peace lily, right? Don't blindly trust Google. A lot of times you'll see sources saying you overwatered, but the problem is that a lot of people will just trust that source and not physically observe their plant. So we need to observe everything with our own senses, with our sense of touch, with our sense of sight, with our, even with our sense of smell, so that we can determine the specific cause. Google can't do that for you. So a lot of times someone might say, well, I Googled that my peace lily is drooping and Google told me that I overwater. The first question I ask in that instance is, did you feel your soil? What does it feel like? When they go to feel the soil, they find that it's bone dry. And then a light goes off. Oh, you know, it, it actually, it drooped because it was bone dry. So you have to use your powers of observation. Don't blindly trust Google. So my plant care approach, I take a holistic plant care approach and plant care topics or factors should not be siloed. And I don't know if that's a real word or not, or if I made that up, um, but we cannot take each aspect of plant care individually and not consider all the other aspects of plant care. So what do I mean by that? We need to consider all of these and I'll go into depth shortly. Light, first and foremost, above everything else, light is the most important topic that we need to be concerned about for our plants. Watering and fertilizing is also very important. The type and size of pots, Humidity, your potting mix, temperature, and also last but not least, consistency. So many people ask me, well, how, how is your plant so beautiful? You can do all, you can have consideration of all of these factors listed here, but if you're not consistent, you can't be on again and off again. Some plants are more forgiving than others, but consistency is so important in plant care as well. So don't underestimate that. Okay, so here are some topics that I really wanted to go in depth in this presentation. And these are all based on all the feedback that I've gotten from all my clients, all my readers, all my followers. The same things come up over and over and over again. Overwatering, watering schedules, I'll touch on that a bit. Moisture meters, many of you may be using these, some of you may not. And I'll also describe important aspects of light potting mixes, repotting, misting, and fertilizing. So let's start with overwatering. So like I said, this, this is a trigger point for me. This word has, has, it just leads to so, so much, it, just so much frustration for, for people and misinterpretations of what it means. So there is virtually no such thing as overwatering unless you have no drainage hole which I always recommend having a drainage hole. If you don't, it can lead to, you can add too much water because the water is nowhere to go. 
and you have to be too careful and you don't want to be tiptoeing around water. And I'll go into that a little bit more in detail shortly again. Um, it also leads to some other issues. If you're fertilizing, all those fertilizer cells will build up in your soil and you'll eventually have issues. It's just not a good idea not to have a drain chawl. Next, your goal when you water should be to thoroughly moisten your potting mix. And what I like to tell people is, do you care about all of your plants roots or just some of them? Because what happens is that the fear, some people have such a fear of overwatering that it causes them to be afraid to water properly. And then you end up having the opposite problem. You end up dehydrating your plant. For example, um, I think this happens, especially with succulents. People are so scared to water properly that they'll measure maybe one tablespoon of water and add it to their succulent. And then over time, it's going to start to decline and look really bad. Even succulents need to be watered properly and thoroughly. And I'll explain, I'll explain why. If you're having issues, if you're having the tiptoe around watering, you have to consider all your other aspects of plant care and determine why, what's going wrong. So I do have a request and it's something for you to consider is to remove the word over watering from your brain. And why is that? What, what, what is the thought process that you should be using instead? So instead of saying overwatering, I would, and this is just to change how you think about plant care, a better approach is to say, my potting mix is staying too wet. And then determine why. Why is your potting mix not drying out? Don't blame proper watering practices. If you're not watering properly, and you know, let's say you have pockets of dry soil because you're watering too shallowly or you're adding just a tiny bit of water, those roots that aren't getting any water will dehydrate and die. And over time, then your root system will suffer. And if your plants up, if your roots suffer, then your entire plant will suffer. So again, you shouldn't have to tiptoe around proper watering. Instead, we need to diagnose the following. Here are the factors that affect soil moisture. I cannot emphasize this enough. So you, we need to consider all of these factors. Number one is light we need to make sure that we're providing enough light for our plants. It's the foundation of photosynthesis. It's how, our, it's how plants survive and everything will work better with light. We also have to consider the potting material. For example, plastic versus terracotta. Plastic pots will retain moisture much more than for example, terracotta, which is basically baked clay. Um, it's very porous and Plants that are in terracotta will dry out much more quickly, especially the tiny pots. You have to watch out for those. Drainage holes or lack thereof, I already discussed that. Accumulation of water in your saucer or your cash pot. So, you know, when, if we're watering in place, we need to be mindful of that. We need to discard excess water so that your plant's not sitting in water for an extended period of time and introducing the risk of root rot. Potting size, this is another huge one. When you, cut, when you go to repot your plant, a good rule of thumb, and again, you can break this rule of thumb as you, as you gain more experience. And with certain plants, a good rule of thumb is only to go one pot size higher than where you're currently at. For example, if you have a four inch pot, a good rule of thumb is to, to go up to a six inch pot diameter. When I say four inch, I mean four inch diameter, and then go to a six inch diameter pot. If you go from a four inch pot to a 10 inch pot, suddenly you're, go you're going to have a, a very large volume of potting mix that's going to take a lot longer to dry out. And so if you combine that with poor light, if you're shoving a plant in, the, in a dark corner, that plant's not gonna dry out as nearly as quickly as you want it to, and that's gonna introduce issues. Um, you also wanna be mindful about how root bound is your plant. I'll go into that shortly. And also temperature and humidity will affect soil moisture as well. More on that shortly. Watering schedules. This is another topic that, um, that is very important. A lot of people have asked me, well, how often do you water your, this is one of my pilea peppermoides, how often do you water your pilea? And unfortunately, you know, the answer is it depends. And that's honestly the best answer. 
I can't tell you once a week. And why is that? Because all of our conditions are different. So I cannot possibly tell you how often to water your plant because my conditions are different from yours. So we saw in the previous slide, all the things that affect soil moisture. Can a schedule work, a watering schedule work? Absolutely, yes. Will it eventually fail? Absolutely, yes. Why is that? So let's say, for example, this scenario happens a lot. You have a plant. You, let's say this pilea. I water it once a week. It'll be fine for a long time. The, what's going to happen? Your plant's going to grow. Conditions are going to change. You know, maybe we're, we're getting into winter or summer. And, you know, your plants are going to use more or less water depending on your conditions. Your plant's eventually going to get very root bound as it grows. And so suddenly the once a week schedule is going to fail because your pot's going to be full of roots and it's going to dry out much more quickly than it used to before. And so you have to adapt and become flexible. This is why watering schedules will eventually fail. So a regular schedule to use as a touch point to check on your plants is absolutely recommended. And then you can use these touch points to determine, okay, do I need to water my plant or do I need to wait a little bit longer? So be flexible, don't be too strict on your watering schedule. I wanna go into now a little bit on the dangers of moisture meters. I'm by no means judging anybody if you're using a moisture meter. If it's working well for you, by all means, keep using it. What I'm about to tell you in the next couple slides are just some information for you to consider if you have not started to use a moisture meter yet, or if you are using one and you suspect that something might be off, please take these words into consideration. A lot of moisture meters are junky and not reliable. You know, those cheap moisture meters or inexpensive moisture meters that you might buy at Lowe's or Home Depot, they're just not reliable. And second of all, they don't even measure moisture. They actually measure conductivity, um, so electrical conductivity. And depending on your potting mix, it can vary drastically, depending on how, how porous your potting mix is, um, depending on the composition of your potting mix, it can be very misleading. And it can also drive the wrong behavior and reduce your ability or willingness to actually observe what's going on with your plant. So let me show you an example. And this, this may even resonate with some of you. Um, and hopefully this person is not on the Zoom presentation here, uh, but someone sent me this, these, these pictures, and I, I did get her permission. I actually made this part of a, a blog post that I had on using moisture meters. Take a look at these plants. On the left, we have a rubber plant, and on the right, we have an aglionema or Chinese evergreen. And they look kind of sad, don't they? And, and my, my friend actually approached me and she said, well, I've been using my moisture meter and it tells me that the soil's moist and that I don't need to water. And I said, well, when was the last time you actually watered your plants? And she goes, oh, it was months ago. Mic drop, that's it. That's all I needed to hear. That's all I needed to hear. I said, go ahead and feel your soil. It's probably bone dry. The edges are probably pulling away from the pots. And I, I you know, you can see the rubber plant, the, the stem on the, the branch on the right lost all of its leaves. It's not completely dead yet, shockingly, but this is one example of why you should not rely on moisture meters. What should you do instead? So I recommend, just like you see in this picture here, feel the potting mix with your finger. Do the finger test. Now, depending on, of course, depending on what plant you have, um, I'll, I'll get into that shortly. Different plants have different moisture requirements. So obviously some plants need to dry out uh, more than others. Uh, I'll get into that, I believe in the next slide. The next point I have here, this is really important, and I did this myself actually two days ago, don't rely on the appearance of the soil only. Sometimes we, we might just visually look at our soil and say, oh, well, it looks dark. Um, I, it's probably still moist, I don't need to water. I did this the other day. I had some, I, I propagated some variegated string of hearts and the soil still looked pretty, pretty dark. So I assumed that, that the potting mix was still moist. I touched it, it was bone dry. Do not rely on the appearance of your soil. Use your finger to test 
and judge the amount of moisture in your soil. Another tactic you can use is lifting your pot to judge the weight. A pot that's become bone dry will be much lighter um, that, than a pot that's sufficiently, um, that has sufficient moisture. And then test it, test it yourself. Pick up a pot when it's bone dry, water it, pick it up later and feel the difference. Get used to that so that you can, you can use that as, a, as an instance to judge your soil moisture in, um, as well. And also know how dry each type of plant likes to get. So general rules of, this is very high level, but it's something that's wonderful to keep in mind as a general rule of thumb. In general, plants with very, very thin leaves, like most ferns, need much more moisture than plants that have thick succulent leaves, such as Hoyas, um, Echeverias, Sansevierias, which those have now been reclassified into the Dracaena genus. Um, that, that's something very good to keep in mind. Most plants like something in between. So for ferns, I would recommend as soon as the surface starts to feel barely dry, barely dry, go ahead and water your fern. Whereas things like Hoyas, Echeverias, Sansevierias, all those, you can safely let those dry out completely, but even those not for terribly long. Most plants will like something in between. So as a general rule of thumb, any, especially you know, plants that are native to rainforest environments, you, know, allow, you still want to allow the top inch or so in general. You know, it's not a hard set fast rule. At least allow the top half inch to an inch to dry out before you water again. So most plants will like that in between. Okay, watering rules of thumb. Always water thoroughly. Do not measure the amount of water. I talked about what that can lead to. If you just measure one or two teaspoons because you're scared of overwatering your succulents, you're going to desiccate your succulents, you're going to damage the root system over time, and your plant will suffer. Even succulents need thorough watering. So don't be afraid of overwatering. What you should be afraid of is not enough light. If your plant has sufficient light, it's going to use much more water. It's going to use it more efficiently, and your soil will dry out in a much quicker rate. Be afraid of oversized pots. Again, because of the, the large volume of soil, you don't wanna go from a four inch pot to you know, repotting it into a 12 inch pot because that soil is going to take forever to dry out. Be afraid of poor drainage. Always have drainage holes, always have drainage holes. And then also this, is, this goes hand in hand with the type of potting mix that you use, which I'll go into shortly as well. You do wanna circle the watering can around the entire surface of the pot until water starts to leave the drainage hole. Leave no air pocket, leave no pockets of dry soil in your pot. And then discard any excess water from your saucer or your cash pot. I, I, I know a lot of times many of us have plants growing into um, right inside of plastic nursery pots and then they're slipped in a decorative pot. I do that too because it's number one, it's easier to transplant um, or repot, take a plant out of a, out of a nursery pot than it is a rigid pot. Um, and you, know, you can easily slip it inside of a decorative pot. So just be careful if you're watering in place that you're not allowing your plant to sit in water uh, for extended periods of time. Let's talk about lights. This is such an important topic. This is the, the first consideration that you should have when you bring any plant home. Everything with a plant works better when there's sufficient light. You want to place your plant in a location in your home where it will thrive. You don't wanna necessarily place the plant where you want it to grow. You wanna place a plant where it wants to grow. Otherwise you'll, you'll run into nothing but issues. So I quoted myself here. <laughs> so I say, placing a plant in a dark corner is basically like having a child and not feeding it. So plants photosynthesize, they use the sunlight, they use carbon dioxide and they use moisture to photosynthesize and create food to create sugars for themselves to grow. If you place your plant in a dark corner, it's not gonna be able to do that. It'll be greatly diminished and it'll cause all sorts of problems. So don't starve your children. <laughs> now, plants indoors can take much more light than you'd think. And I have a graph on the next slide where 
I'll demonstrate that. And also remember this, there is much less light indoors than you would think. So consider, consider this. And I talk about this in depth in my book, Houseplant Warrior. So this graph here shows light intensity drop with respect to distance from a window. And I actually measured this myself. So I have a light meter. They're very fun to play around with. So what I did was I took the light meter and I started off, um, I started off right at the window. So that very first dot you see in the upper left-hand corner, so where you see on the x-axis or the horizontal axis there, um, if you're not familiar with, with reading graphs, so distance from the window, if you see that at the bottom, in feet. So at the zero foot mark, it measured at about a little bit under 1500 foot candles. And a foot candle is just basically a measure of light intensity. Now, look at the second dot. As I moved one foot, only one foot away from the window, the light intensity dropped to, looks like maybe around 900 foot candles. Look at what happens at two feet away from the window. Suddenly now we have under 400 foot candles of light. Look at that drastic reduction. And then it levels off a little bit there. Four best results. Now, of course it depends, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but in general, you want to place your plants as close to a window as you can without touching the window. Now, there are many plants that can do perfectly well far away from a window. And I, you know, if you guys have any questions at the end, I'd be, I'd be happy to talk about that. But this light should be the very first consideration. I also talk about in my book, um, I go into this deeply, light acclimation. And, and the purpose of this slide here is twofold. Number one, I've had tons of people come to me say, well, my plant was struggling, you know, it's been a hard winter. And if, if you're like me, I live in Ohio, I live in Northeast Ohio, we have horrible winters, dark, short days, horrible cold winters, not very conducive to growing plants. Um, I supplement with, with grow lights in my sunroom. Um, and so some people, some people message, message me and say, well, my plant looked a little sad over the winter, so, you know, when it warmed up a little bit, I put my plant outside and now it, 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 I don't think my plant likes the sun. I don't know what happened. It looks like it burned. This, this happens over and over and over again. Be very careful. Be very careful when you move any plant outside or when you suddenly increase the intensity of the light. So let's say you have a plant that's been indoors for, for a long time. When you move it outside, when, when the weather warms up, if you do that, always place it in shade. You need to place it completely in shade because the light intensity outdoors, even in the shade, is much, 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 much stronger than it is indoors. So you wanna place it in complete shade outdoors so that it can get used to it. So it can get used to the, the additional light. If you place your plant into full sun after it's been indoors and you place it in full sun outside, immediately it's going to burn in, the, in a matter of hours. So you have to gradually acclimate the amount of light, otherwise you can quickly burn it. And this goes even for sun-loving plants, even for sun-loving plants like any succulents, hibiscus, cactus, all of those plants can burn. So be very, very wary of that. The other reason that I wanted to show this slide is what do we have here? We have a Sansevieria or Dracaena. I don't know if I can get used to calling them Dracaenas. Uh, I call them snake plants. A common name is snake plant, right? Um, that, I took a picture of that actually in California. You can see that that's growing in full sun. On the right, I took a picture of this one as well. This one is, that's a rubber plant. And that one is also growing in full sun. There's a misconception of low light plants. A lot of times these plants are labeled on plant labels as low light. They will, they will tolerate low light. They will do much better if you provide a lot stronger light, especially inside your home. And these are growing outside where the light intensity is so much more. Do not be afraid to give your plants sun inside, even if 
you notice on the label that it says, you know, the dreaded bright and direct light. Most plants indoors, unless you live somewhere that has super, super strong sun by the equator or in a very tropical climate, most plants indoors can do very, very well with at least some sun, including morning sun. Okay, let's talk a little bit about potting mixes here. So there isn't one magic potting mix. You can, uh, you can adjust and alter to suit your conditions and needs. Keep this in mind, the chunkier material you add, the quicker your mix will dry out. So you can see here in the photo in the upper right-hand corner, I have pumice, um, which is basically like little stones, volcanic, um, they're volcanic in origin. Pum um, perlite in the lower right-hand corner, much lighter material, orchid bark, and there's a lot of different things that people mix in. The chunkier material you add, the, the more your potting mix will dry out. It can backfire though, be careful. Just the other day, two days ago, someone messaged me or emailed me with help with their Monstera deliciosa. And they said, I keep losing leaves on it. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And you know, they described their care. I said, please send me, send me a picture, I'll take a look at it. Once they sent the picture, I noticed that their potting mix was predominantly bark, orchid bark, big pieces of orchid bark. I said, and I said, I wrote back, and I mentioned, I, I can tell from the picture, you're using orchid bark. You're probably not watering it enough because with a mix like that, it's going to dry out super, super, super quickly. And what's happening is your plant is going to, it's going to dry out and you can't keep up with the watering. So be careful of going overboard. You want a balance of being able to have a potting mix that retains some moisture, but you also want good drainage. So most commercial potting mixes at least for me, I consider them not to have good porosity. So I, I do amend them with some of these materials. And a good blend, like I mentioned, should have sufficient moisture retention, but also dry out in a reasonable amount of time, but not too quickly. In general, and again, you'll have to play around to see what suits your conditions. For any leafy tropical rainforest native type plant, you know, peace lilies, um, any foliage plants, even you know a lot of your aeroids, a good rule of thumb is two or three parts of an all-purpose potting mix and one part of perlite. Some people like to add orchid bark. They might do equal parts orchid bark, perlite, and potting mix. That's going to dry out a lot more, more quickly. So if you tend to overwater, that might be a good potting mix for you because the risk of root rot is going to be much, much less that way. Um, for succulents, I like to use about two parts of cactus soil and then one part pumps. Okay, but again, it depends on your conditions. Let's talk a little bit on repotting. So this is my ponytail palm, which is not a palm at all, actually. Um, it's actually su a succulent. Look how root bound it is. Um, but don't rush to repot. Oftentimes it's done much too frequently as something to try and help a suffering plant that isn't even root bound. If you don't need to disturb your plant's roots, don't do it. Only repot when it needs to be done, when your plant is root bound. Um, technically, if you're going to a larger pot, it's called up potting. I don't like to use that. I just say repot into a larger pot. <laughs> but the proper term is up potting when you go, go up a pot size. But only do it when it really needs to be done. I see far too many people repotting when it's really not necessary. Some repotting tips. So here's the same root ball, the same ponytail palm I have. Loosen the root ball. This is so critical, especially if you have a super root bound plant. And the reason this is important, I'll give you another example. Um, my peace lily that I got from my dad's funeral many years ago, I got lazy. I put it in a larger pot. When I took it out of the container, it was really root bound. And I left it alone. All the roots were circled around. They were tightly, tightly wound up. And I placed it in a larger pot. I did not loosen the root ball. And it just sat there. It was kind of sad. And then I said, what, what the heck is going on with this plant? And I took it out of the pot. I don't know, maybe a couple of years later. This was many years ago at this point. And the roots did not budge. None of the roots grew into the potting, the new potting mix in the new pot after two years of being in this pot because I did not loosen the root ball. So if you have a highly root bound plant, be sure to loosen the root ball. 
loosen the roots as best as you can. You don't have to go crazy, but this will help the new uh, roots to grow into the new soil. And again, like I mentioned earlier, only go up one size generally. You can break this rule as you gain more experience um, with, with growing houseplants. So again, if you have a, maybe a six inch pot and you, it needs a larger home, go up to an eight inch diameter pot and not a 12 inch pot. Again, that's a general rule of thumb. I'm not saying you would never do that, but in, in many cases that, that would be a good idea. Misting. Okay, so what is humidity? So people mist because they think it increases humidity. The definition of humidity is the amount of water vapor in the air. So just common sense will tell us if we spritz our plants a couple times, that's not gonna do anything to increase the humidity in, in your air. Misting will have virtually a zero impact on humidity. What does it actually do? It just wets your leaves. You're just wetting your plant's leaves. It will have virtually no effect on humidity. Um, if it makes you feel better, go ahead and do it. That's fine. There are certainly benefits to it. Uh, one of the benefits that I, can, that I can tell you is, especially if you have dry indoor air in the winter, it can also, uh, misting your plants slightly can, can help deter spider mites because they like, uh, spider mites like warm, dry conditions. So that's one benefit. But if you overdo it, you can help introduce fungal issues and you don't want that either. So if you really want to increase humidity, the best way is to get a humidifier that's rated for your size room. So if you have, that's very important. I can't overemphasize this enough. So humidifiers will be rated to a certain square footage of a room. And for example, I might say this is good for rooms up to 600 square feet. So if you have a room that's you know, a thousand square feet, that won't be enough to have a measurable impact on increasing the humidity. On the other hand, if you have a room that's say 200 square feet and you get a humidifier that's rated for 600 square feet, that's great because it's going to do a wonderful job and you probably won't be needing, it, needing to run it as, free, as um, often. So other methods to increase humidity, you know, you can set plants on moist pebbles. This will work too. Um, I still think getting a humidifier is, is the best option. And then hoarding plants together. I'm sure many of us on this call have this issue as I do. Um, so if you have a lot of plants together, what happens is plants transpire water, they release air, air uh, uh, I'm having a brain freeze here. Um, so water vapor into, into, the, into your indoor air and create their own microclimate. So this actually helps to increase humidity a little bit, but you still, again, if you, you do wanna get a humidifier, if you have bone dry air, if you're running forced air heat in the winter time, like I do. And another point that a lot of us don't think about, when you increase humidity, you also want to increase air circulation as much as possible because this will help minimize fungal issues. We don't have the benefit indoors of wind like plants do outside. So this would take the, take the spot, um, the replacement of wind. Okay, so before blaming low humidity for brown crispy leaf edges, a lot of times this is caused by super dry soil. So don't mistake it for that. So for many plants, if you're able to maintain appropriate soil moisture, this will be sufficient. There are those finicky plants that do love high humidity that are, you know, indoors are, are tricky. But in the, for most cases, that should be fine. Fertilizing, okay. Don't fertilize to compensate for cultural shortcomings. So if you're shoving a plant in, in a dark corner in your home and it's not growing, don't think, oh, I'm gonna fertilize it so it can start growing. Don't do that. Fertilization should be part of, it, you should think of it as a supplementation. Think of it as giving your plants extra vitamins, but you do need to have everything nailed down first, such as appropriate light, making sure you have appropriate light so your plant's growing, and then appropriate, um, your watering, your, your watering is, um, you have good watering techniques as well. If you fertilize a plant that's sitting in the dark, you're gonna cause more harm than good because you're gonna increase the instance of very weak growth and you don't want that. Okay. Why do we have to fertilize? So plants and pots indoors don't have the benefit of receiving nutrients from decaying leaves, from animal droppings, et cetera, like they do in nature. 
So we need to fertilize to compensate for that. Um, quick fertilizer info, I'm gonna go very quickly here. I know we're running out of time and I want to have some time for questions. Um, this is the particular fertilizer that I use. All fertilizers will have what's called an NPK ratio. So this stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, for those of you that remember chemistry class. So, um, and the numbers that you see, the three numbers are the, the proportion uh, or the percentage of those, um, of those nutrients found in the fertilizer. Nitrogen is used for, plants use nitrogen for leaf growth. Phosphorus is, uh, plants use that for flower and root growth. And then potassium, there's a lot of different things, but some of the things that potassium affects are um, a lot of plant processes, disease resistance, and, and a lot more. You don't need to know all the technicalities of this, but fertilization should be a good part of your plant, house plant care routine. Some tips, measure out the liquid fertilizer and water, do not eyeball. So I have dedicated measuring spoons here. Um, I add you know, half a teaspoon per gallon of water and I measure the water too. Don't eyeball it. You can easily have fertilizer burn if you're just estimating the, um, the amounts. And you can fertilize anytime a plant is actively growing. Um, don't be afraid to fertilize in the winter if your plants are growing and you have amazing light, especially if you have grow lights on all the time. Okay, so I wanna wrap up here just a couple of slides. This is my book, um, Houseplant Warrior, then we'll open it up for questions here shortly. Um, it is coming out in, um, in March, so March 15th. I'm super excited about it. I talk about everything I've talked about in this presentation in much more detail. I also have some case studies diagnosing plant problems as well as uh, I talk a lot about propagation and I have profiles of dozens of houseplants with their specific care and also how to deal with pests. So I touch on everything. It's coming out March 15th. And if you go to my website, ohiotropics.com, you can click on that big black button there to pre-order it if you'd like to purchase the book or also go to the book menu on top and it'll populate that. Click on Houseplant Warrior. I also have a couple, couple other books there. Um, that I self-published, but this is my first traditionally published book. Um, you can find me at my blog, ohiotropics.com. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, and email me at ohio, uh, raphael at ohiotropics.com. You can also use the contact form on my website. And lastly, real quick, these are some of my services and products. So I do offer virtual and in-home plan consultations. That information is on my website. Um, I do speaking engagements as well as workshops and provide my informational blog with a weekly newsletter if you subscribe. And I already talked about my books here. I would ignore the last one, Essential Houseplant Mastery. Um, if you're going to get any one book, I would suggest definitely Houseplant Warrior. And Moth Orchid Mastery is actually a very, very popular, very short book where I talk about the care of Phalaenopsis orchids that's available on my website as, as well. So that is everything. Can we um, take some questions now, Jacqueline? I know some comments have been coming. Yeah, in. so um, I'm gonna, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Uh, speaking of grow lights, how do you know what a good one is? Um, and they bought one online and they can't tell um, if it even is working <laughs> for their plants. No, that, that's, that's great. So I do, have, um, I do have a blog post where I talk about, I'm trying to get this um, to show me here. Um, can, you guys, can you guys see me now? Uh, hang on a second. Yeah, I could see the whole time, just I changed my view so I could see you. Okay, okay. Is it if actually I become host, can you still, can people still see him? I'm guessing they can, but. Okay, hang on, stop screen sharing. Okay, here we go. How about now? Yeah. All right, I think this is better. Um, so a good, I would recommend, so you can go with, there's fluorescent grow lights, there's LED grow lights, and there's, there's a lot of those lights that have that, I think it's horribly ugly purple cast to it. There's absolutely no reason that, it, it just makes everything look weird. You don't need to, to use those. Um, there's a lot of good 
full spectrum LED lights. So LED lights will, they cost a little bit more, look for a full spectrum one. They cost a little bit more than fluorescent, but it's gonna be a lot cheaper to run in the long run. Mm -hmm. And you do want a full spectrum, um, a full spectrum light. I can provide maybe a link over to you, Jacqueline. Maybe we can send it over to all the participants. And this. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, you can put it in the chat too. And yeah, at Perfect. the end here, I'll leave it on. Um, so if you have any links um, awesome. for, for that. What else? What other um, so how do you reduce gnats in houseplants? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. Okay, fungus gnats. And I, I have a blog post. I have a blog post for everything where I go through my process to reduce fungus gnats. So fungus gnats are caused by, if you have your potting mix wet all the time, it's going to be, it's gonna aggravate the issue. Um, oftentimes they'll come in even with your potting mixes. They'll, they'll come in with your potting mixes. If you have a potting mix that has a lot of organic material, they feed off of that. Um, you can still deal with them. So what I would recommend, one way to deal with them, um, I'm, I'm summarizing this in a nutshell, but I'll also share my blog post that has every single step. If you let at least the surface dry out, this is very important, let the surface dry out, at least the top inch, that will help kill, um, it'll help manage um, manage the fungus gnats that happen to be in your soil. You do want to use the sticky yellow fly traps to capture the adults because the, uh, you, you want to reduce the amount of adults because your adults are going to lay eggs. And so if you capture the adults, it'll help control that. And then there's a product that, I, that is very good to use that has, um, it's a beneficial bacteria called BTI. I don't remember what it stands for but it's a beneficial bacteria. If you look for mosquito bits, if you buy mosquito bits, you can use that product. And after a few weeks, if, if you do all these steps that I talked about, it'll, you can eliminate fungus gnats. Um, and I'm happy to share the, the blog post as well that has all the steps. And I do talk about this as well in my, in my book, House Plant Warrior. Yeah, I just typed it, BT will be on the bottle. Um, it's used commonly outdoors too. Yep. Um, our plants. Um, and that brings up to the point too that for watering, you can bottom water or set your plants in water. Um, if you have a gnat problem and it will soak up water through the bottom of the pot and it will keep that top dry, but just make sure that the soil is soaking up enough water for all your roots in that case. Um, but it just kind of helps, especially when you're dealing with the gnats to do that way temporarily even just to um, reduce the water on the top layer of soil. Absolutely. Um, let's see here. So um, what is, oh, well, that's, I'm missing one. In the winter, is it bad if a plant is too hot, uh, too hot from the heater? The upstairs is hot in our house, but has great lighting. Ah. Th that's a great question. So I would say as long as your plant is not right in front of the vent, you don't want your, your vent blowing hot air onto your plant. It can quickly burn the leaves. But the temperature, if it's creating a nice, toasty, warm room, that's wonderful if your plant likes that. If your plant, you know, if, if you have a plant that's, that enjoys warmer temperatures, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure that it's not right in front of your vent because that can quickly burn, burn your leaves. And, and also dry out the air. So um, as, you know, as you're increasing temperature, with, with heat, you want to compensate too, if you can, by, by running a humidifier if, you're, if your air gets bone dry as well. And um, yeah, I think the, the, the heat's fine, uh, usually. Some plants like it colder, but yeah, as long as the humidity is good. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, so is it important to dust your plants? Yes, absolutely. I like, for, for if, Anybody on this call follows me on, on my Instagram. I'm always posting videos of this. I take my plants to the shower. I bring them to the shower. I rinse them off. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You don't want a lot of accumulation of dust on your plants. If your plant's too big to move, what I like to do is I'll take a, I'll take a sponge. I'll moisten a sponge, or you can use a paper towel too, but a sponge is, you know, it's more environmentally friend friendly. You can rinse it off. You can reuse it. Um, so wipe off the leaves, absolutely, because what, what that's going to do is it'll, it'll help your plant grow. It'll help your plant 
photosynthesize because the dust is gonna block, block some of the light. And it'll also block the pores. So plants have openings, they're basically pores called stomata. And so they use that for gas exchange, they use it to release uh, water into, into, into the air. So if those are clogged, then it's gonna hinder your plant from, from doing its thing. So absolutely, uh, wash it off, wash your plants off, wipe off the leaves and keep them clean. Uh, it's great for pest mitigation too. Absolutely, yes. It, it check, you can check your leaves during the whole process of wiping off and you can see if there's spider mites, et cetera. So it's a good practice. Um, what is the best care for a bonsai tree? And this is really a deep intermediate professional kind of question. So maybe a, maybe a synopsis of. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm not, I'm definitely not a bonsai expert, although um, what I will say, the, the one thing that comes to mind immediately for bonsai, I'm not gonna give tips on pruning or any of that stuff, but just be careful because bonsai just by the nature of bonsai, they're kept in smaller containers. So we're, we're basically artificially dwarfing our plants. And because of the small size of the containers, you really have to watch the watering. So make sure that you know, those containers are, they're gonna dry out pretty quickly. So watch the soil moisture. So that's the only, the, the one thing I would say to, to be very careful of um, because the pots are, are generally so small. So yeah, to the person who asked the question, um, the leave their yellow, the leaves were um, fell off. I'm guessing it's because of under I should shouldn't say over or underwatering, but yeah. bonsais do dry out really fast um, because of the soil they're in. Um, it's really rocky. Um, I have a bonsai as well, right on my window still. So lots of light, as much light as possible usually, and um, I touch the top of my soil. I actually have teeny little moss growing on top and that actually gives me a good indication if there's enough moisture. If that moss starts getting a little dry, I'm like, uh-oh, my bonsai is probably not gonna be happy soon. So yeah. it's hard to touch the soil of a bonsai. I don't mean to go too much into it, but uh -huh. it's hard to touch the soil of a bonsai with the rocks on top. Sometimes, you know, they're glued. So you can't actually like tell. So I like to do the, the weight test for the, my bonsai. Um, it, that's why it is a kind of intermediate plant, but they are super cool and beautiful. And it's yeah. fun, but um, and I would say if you're interested in buying a bonsai, I, I know you mentioned the the ones that have the glued rocks on top. I would try and avoid those if possible. Absolutely, um, yeah. And with the yellowing leaves, mo you can be pretty sure if if the lower leaves are yellowing, go ahead and touch your soil immediately. Chances are that the soil's dried out immediately. It's always the oldest and the, the lowest leaves that will turn yellow if your soil has gone bone dry. Right on, yeah. So, oh yeah, so going back to the grow lights real quick, um, how long do you keep the grow light on? Wonderful question. And so there, different people do different things. I personally leave my grow lights on for 12 hours a day and I put them on a timer to be you know, so that you're not, it, it just makes it so much easier. So I, I would say, I would say 10 to 12 hours a day. If you do 12 hours, you're going to be, you're going to be great. Um, put it on a timer for, and then you can forget about it. I assume and picture them in a tropical environment. So if you're, if, if they're, you know, we are closer to the equator, you know, 7am to 7pm, you know, yeah. they'll be fine. <laughs> Exactly. And so you're, you're basically getting half and half. So that's, that's what happens. And, and you bring up a good point, Jacqueline. We, we want to try and mimic what, what we see plants do in nature, you know, with turning on a fan for air circulation, or, you know, like you said, 12 hours a day, because the daylight and nighttime are about equal at the equator. And a lot of our plants come from rainforest environments. So we want to try and mimic, mimic what we see in nature. That's always a good rule of thumb. Um, and then the, do we need um, neem oil for bugs? So that, that's definitely one option. I personally, I don't like the smell of it, so I don't mm -hmm. use it. But you can, a lot of people have had success to, to treat you know, spider mites, mealy bugs, um, th things, of, things of, those, of that nature. Um, so you can definitely use that with any pest mitigation or uh, pest treatment, the, the most important part, regardless of what product you use, 
is, uh, I'll, I'll try not to ramble too much on this, but early detection, it's so much easier to treat pests when you catch them early. Number two is when, when you choose your product, be very persistent. Do it routinely and keep spraying even after you stop seeing the pests. Because a lot of times we won't see the little tiny, you know, there, there's stuff that we don't see. And so we want to keep, keep applying until after, even after we stop seeing them. And you want to be more persistent than, than the bugs. And the next question, um, they have a mother, mother's tongue, uh, Sansevieria, uh, yes. or Dracaena. Dris yes. <laughs> Look at all these names that for just for one plant. Uh, it's getting very tall, but it's starting to lean some, um, knowing that there's various factors that we don't know. Is there, are, are there any tips? Yeah, so I mean, without knowing your, your conditions there, typically when I see them lean, lean over, it could be, it could be from not enough light. Um, you saw the picture of you know, the one that was growing in full sun. So keep this in mind for snake plants or mother-in-law's tongue, as some of us call it. Those plants, you, we have to be careful. Some plants respond a lot slower than others. So a snake plant is one example. Uh, succulents like an echeveria is another example. You can put them far away in a dark corner. They're gonna take a little bit of time to respond to it, but they will eventually respond and they will eventually hate it. And they'll, they'll turn out with much more weaker growth and spindly growth. Um, so keep that in mind. It'll take the snake plant a long time to respond to, to low light. Um, but typically, if it's leaning over, it could be due to, due to that, um, to lower light. So consider increasing your light. I'm not sure where you have your plant. But another one, this is another case, and this I, I experienced this one myself with one, one of my plants. It had gotten so crowded in its pot that the rhizomes underneath the soil actually started, it had nowhere to go. So it was pushing the pot. It was heaving out of the pot and the entire thing was leaning over. So th that's another possibility too. Um, if neither of those answer your question, feel free to email me and uh, email me photos, raphael at ohiotropics.com and I'd be happy to help. Yeah, if we don't, well, I'm going to try to get to as many questions here, but I don't want to keep you too long, Raphael. <laughs> yeah, I have plenty um, of time, so as, as long as you guys have time, that's... Great, that's yeah, you guys can stay on as long as you want. Oh, well, maybe not as long as you want. Maybe if you want to <laughs> chat with each other, I can keep it up. <laughs> um, so let's see here. Um, I have a plant with dry tips, a palm. Um, do I trim the edges at an, on an angle? Or do you trim the edges at all, I should ask? Yeah, when I, whenever I have brown crispy, we all get it. We all have brown, you know, tips on, especially on, on certain plants are prone, like you mentioned, palms. Um, yes, I do trim them. So what, what I like to do is I, I'll trim, I'll, I'll trim most of the brown part off, but I'll leave a really, really, really narrow margin of the brown part. Um, a lot of times if you, if you go into the green part, then that'll start to turn brown, even more brown. Um, so we all have different ways to do it. That's what I do. Um, also, um, you can do that, but determine why. Determine why you got the brown tips. Did it dry out? Did the soil dry out too much? Oftentimes, that's a lot. A lot of times, that's what causes it. With palms, they love really, really high humidity, mm. um, and that's hard to provide inside the home. So that's another thing to consider. But watering, proper watering, is way more important than increasing humidity. If you have both, then it'll help control that in for many plants for many plants yeah and i think that's the thing um i had a question about like cold wind or draft or heat yes. a lot of the times our plants are uh they're taking in some moisture too th through their leaves and losing moisture through their leaves um so i mean that's when we say the plant likes high humidity it's because of like they like that you know they like to have that extra humidity and they're not taking up through the roots necessarily so that's why you want to avoid the cold and hot drafts um, because it dries, those typically will dry your plant out quicker. Absolutely. Um, let's see here. Oh, I have a ZZ plant with some exposed bulbs. Is that bad? Good question. Um, not necessarily, not necessarily. Um, Actually, so my ZZ plant that has bulbs exposed. <laughs> yeah, mine, mine does too. Actually, both of mine do. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, if, if your soil, you know, as you're watering, sometimes the soil spills out or, or drain, goes through the drainage hole. If it's gone down a lot, 
you can go ahead and replace, you know, add some more potting mix on top. Just don't bury, don't bury it too much. Just make it so that it's barely underneath the surface of the soil. It's not necessarily bad if you only have a tiny bit showing. That's not going to do, um, you know, much um, for for your plant. It, it, it'll be fine as long as it's stable. Yes. <laughs> I think that's all I really worry about. It can yes. get really tall. So. <laughs> um, Oh, does the temp of the water matter? Um, and do the temp the chemicals in water need to be filtered? Great questions. Mm -hmm. Does the temperature of the water matter? Yes. Typically, I would have do not water with cold water. Um, I, I like to say, you know, room temperature or even a little bit, a little bit warm to the touch, because the soil will absorb, will absorb it uh, better that way. Especially, so let's say. Another thing I see a lot is when we let our plants dry out so much that you, you know you lift your pot and, and you, you say, "Wow, it's so light." And around the perimeter of the pot, you know, it's it's kind of pulled in, and you have the gap around the perimeter. When a lot of potting mixes get so dry, you have to work to rehydrate the soil, so the soil actually becomes hydrophobic and it actually hates water. So you're gonna to have to water several times in a, in a row, especially if you have peat moss in, in the mix, it'll tend, to, it'll tend to repel water if it gets too dry. So water it several times in a row. And if you use warmer water, not hot, just warm to the touch water, um, water several times in a row to help hydrate it so that the, the soil can accept moisture again. Um, also don't water orchids with ice cubes. Please don't, don't do that. <laughs> Please don't do that. Um, they, you know, they, they, they grow in tropical environments. They, there's no ice, there's no ice, there's no cold water, um, most plants that, that we grow. And then the second question was, I forgot already. <laughs> uh, chemicals. Uh, tap water, air, air quality, uh, water quality, sorry. Um, so the, 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 and maybe you can chime in Jacqueline on this too. I have so many plants that I don't, I don't bother. I just use plain tap water. We have hard water uh, and for most plants, it's perfectly fine. I wouldn't worry about it. Um, some people let the water sit out overnight. It may, you know, it's gonna remove any gases that are in there, but it's not gonna remove, it's not gonna remove the fluoride. It's not, there's, there's a, a chlorine compound called chloramine. It is not gonna remove the chloramine. Um, if it makes you feel better doing that, go ahead and do it. It's not gonna cause, it's not gonna do any harm, it may even do some good. Um, if you wanna use filtered water, that's that's great. I, I would say rainwater is amazing in most cases. Um, if you no. wanna use filtered water, um, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Also, yeah. is it in snow for people who get no, snow? No, yes, yes. <laughs> more work, we'll have to melt the snow. We have about two feet here where I am now. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you wanna use you know, reverse osmosis water, that's fine too. If you wanna use distilled water, use that. Just remember, if your water is too pure, that can cause issues too, because there's no nutrients in there. So you want to make sure that you're regularly fertilizing in order to provide those nutrients. Otherwise, you can be going, you know, too far in the opposite direction. If that makes sense. Um, um, any, with the water like chemicals, um, I it's unfortunate. I mean, it's fortunate for me because I have aquarium water, which has a ton of beautiful Wonderful. nutrients, and it doesn't have any chlorine or chloramine in it anymore because I use a water conditioner. Uh, which you can get to use for plants, I guess, but I wouldn't, it's maybe a waste of money. Um, but uh, there are plants, I think like, I don't know if you've had this Raphael with like calathea or prayer plant yes. being more sensitive. I'm sorry if I miss that if you said that, but um, I, I find that there's only certain plants that are really sensitive to the, you know, chlorine in the water. Um, yeah, definitely the ones that you mentioned, um, definitely. And then certain plants are notoriously known for fluoride sensitivities. And I think spider plants will do that. Um, corn plants or, you know, Dracaena, um, you know, the, uh, gosh, I forgot the species. It's not Dracaena marginata, but the regular corn plant, um, I, the, the species uh, escapes me. Yeah, I'm forgetting right now. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Um, with, with the big thick canes. Yeah, those the, are it's like mass cane or yeah, whatever. Yeah, the whatever. general name's mass cane, I think. <laughs> yeah, so other than that, I, I wouldn't be too concerned uh, other than these plants that we just mentioned. 
as far as water quality, um, tap water will be fine in most cases. And calatheas are very, 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 very sensitive for that. Yeah. So you might have, you know, distilled water definitely could be best option for that, but add some fertilizers every so often so you're not starving your plant too. Yeah. Um, now I was thinking about that with water for, for orchids is that I've actually over fertilized orchids and killed them before because they, they get a lot of nutrients from the, from the air and dust and yeah. they're very weird plants. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and one thing before I forget, if you're, if you have a home water softening unit that replaces, um, what, what that does is it replaces the, the, the minerals in tap water with sodium. Sodium is toxic for plants, oh. especially in high levels. So if you have a water softener that uses sodium, be careful of that because of the toxicity of uh, sodium for, for plants in high concentrations. I think I got through all the questions here. Um, oh, best care for nerve plants. Those ones are a tough one for me too. Nerve plants? Mm-hmm. The nerve yeah, those are, um, those, those are tough. So the thing to watch out for those two is they don't like, they hate to dry out. They'll just go, yeah. they'll plop over. They hate to dry out. As soon as the very surface of the, of the potting mix feels dry, go ahead and water it. Don't let it sit in water, but you do want to keep it fairly moist. They do like, uh, you know, don't give them a lot of direct sun. Put them in front of a window, a nice bright window. If they get a little bit of morning sun, perfect. Most plants will be, will you know, grow amazingly well with morning sun inside. Uh, but, but the key with those is don't let them dry out. They're, they're just gonna plop over. And then every time they droop and wilt, you're gonna weaken them over and over and over and over again, um, you know, and then you'll get a sad plant. You know, the only time that I've had really good chance with nerve plant uh, that has did well was outside in shade, filtered, filtered sun planted in yeah. an annual pot actually. Okay. Um, mixed with another house plant. I had a philodendron and nerve plant in there nice. and man, they did awesome. So yeah. I had, I started, I started in the North side of the house because of acclimation to the heat and whatever, cause yes. the heat will dry them out faster. So Ada, if you want to try it outside and maybe start mimicking some of those, um, environmental factors, you'll start getting a little bit better, bringing it back inside and seeing if you can, uh, keep that care going indoors because man, they did so much better outside for some reason. Maybe it was the humidity from the Minnesota winter or winter summers, you know, I don't know, but they liked, I think they liked that humidity. I didn't have to yeah. water them as much as do, All plants will do better outside. Just, I know it's really, yeah. We say yeah. house plants, but they're really all outdoor plants that we've brought in. <laughs> there's no such thing as a house plant. Exactly. No, there's no, yeah. yeah. Certain, certain plants make better house plants than others. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so they have a pothos, like we have a couple more questions that lost okay. almost all its leaves except near the ends. Um, can I trim it way, way back and replant the ends? Oh, okay. So uh, the I'm guessing they lost the leaves on the bottom and then the top, the ends probably are like the end of the vine probably. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So can they trim it, trim it back and replant? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I would recommend taking, um, trimming, trim off all the ends. You can root them first in water and plant them back in soil. I don't know. Um, I, I would have to actually see the plant. If you're able to plant it back in the same container, you can. Otherwise, start, just go ahead and start a new plant. But ask her, hopefully you know why that happened, um, you know, so that you're preventing it from happening again when you start your new plant, right? Um, what, what I see a lot of times with, with pothos too, Again, we talked about this uh, earlier. If you let everything dry out repeatedly, the lower leaves are going to turn yellow. They're going to fall off, and it's just going to keep happening until you get a, a you know, a, a stringy plant. Um, so th th there's a lot of different reasons. That's probably the most common reason. But absolutely, start off with a new one. Try to provide as consistent conditions as possible when it comes to light, when it comes to soil moisture, so that you know what happened to it and you can keep it fuller. Um, yeah. When I've had that happen, it's usually because I've forgotten to water or the pot's yeah. too small now to keep my watering. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's usually when I have the the closest to the soil leaves fall first. That's yes. usually what that's usually what's been happening for me. If, that's right. Um, so maybe that'll be a good indication if maybe not to say that you need to repot, but you know, maybe there's just watering issue there. Yeah. Um 
So I'm, oh, I just want to say maybe before people leave to, um, you know, if you're uh, shoppers at Drummers and you read about the coupon, um, we have your name in the store. So whenever you come in, um, we'll have your name and you can use that $5 coupon in the store. Um, just so you know, if that's how it's going to work. So you won't like receive a physical one unless you want to use it later. We can give you a $5 coupon in the store to use at a later time. So that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, and I think that's all the questions we have. Wait. Yeah. Just people thanking you for your time. Well, thank you everybody for joining. I had fun. I, I know it, it's different when you're not in person, but um, I appreciate everybody attending. I hope you found information valuable. Yeah, and and again, Raphael's here for any questions. I'm usually the one who answers emails and Facebook and Instagram messages. So if you have a question about house plants, um, if I don't know the answer, I always ask some of my you know <laughs> coworkers. Um, pictures are great. So I love, pictures love, love the valuable. pictures. Uh, Wendy just sent me a picture. I'm going to look at it. I think your snake plant looks great other than just part, some of them are just leaning over. Um, might just be, you know, just, it's huge. Might just be because it's big. <laughs> and it's just, yeah. sometimes you got to tie them up. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so pictures are great for us to help diagnose problems if, um, you know, if something's just not, it's just not working no matter what you're doing to help fix it so um and we'll ask you all these questions so sorry if it seems like we'll be nosy with the plants we'll say what how, what's your soil like and what's the light like <laughs> i always feel like i'm being really nosy. <laughs> um and i will send a link um i'll send a link to everybody that signed up um with a recording um probably in mon on Monday, because it takes a little while to compress and for me to upload it um, to YouTube. So it'll be probably Monday that you'll get a link um, for the recording. Um, so you can rewatch it or if you missed part of it. Um, yeah, everybody's just saying thank you, Raphael. I hope you can see that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for everyone um, signing up. I hope everybody got some good information. I really liked listening to the holistic approach. He has some really great points. Um, I, I, I still Google plant problems, um, but really those are the key things that he covered. Um, and you'll start, you'll start learning about each of your plants and your space with the light and humidity, and then you'll just become an expert. And I know it's kind of sucky to move sometimes because your environment changes, but once you start getting those key things to look at, you'll be able to just kind of, you know, switch on a dime on, on how to, you know, maintain your plants. So um, anyways, thanks a lot. I'm going to end it here. So and uh, yeah, I'll see you later. Thanks, Jacqueline. Thank you everyone for attending. Bye.